on the record on H610, draft 7.1. And Eric will do a quick walk. First. Thank you. Welcome. Sure. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here this afternoon to talk about uh, the new proposed <coughs> strike all amendment to H610, after waiting to firearms and domestic violence. See, we're on version 7.1 now. And you probably have already noticed this if you had a chance to look at it, but we've uh, continued with our process of using colors to highlight which changes are from have been made to the previous draft and this one we have I believe we've moved on to green. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the first ones were highlighted in yellow, then you had sort of a light blue turquoise. You're gonna need a key second I think time around. I think we may <laughs> yes, we probably should have like there's, a separate. there's no way to win this one. You either like lose the changes over time or you get you know things in Senate colors, which makes it really the <laughs> uh, so I'll focus on the changes, uh, but feel free, of course, to jump in and stop me if uh, something comes up related to what had been done earlier. I'm going to pass right over section one. That's the default proceed section. And the last time we talked about the fact that the, it's now a 30-day a uh, window as far as uh, when the sale would be permitted to proceed without a response from Nix. That has unchanged from the previous draft. You see no green there. You will start to see some green in the release from abuse order section. And in fact, I should, uh, you may have already noticed this too. I believe there's a, a numbering issue with the sections. I'll, we'll fix that in the editorial process, but that actually should be section two, I believe, not section three. Um, but uh, the section itself is brand new in the sense that it was not in the previous draft. This is a product of, I think, what has been termed the the group that was meeting outside the committee room to try and come up with some proposed language and the various members uh, of uh, different uh, organizations trying to reach agreement on what some language would look like. That's uh, what this is in part of. And you'll see that it's proposing a new, uh, there's an existing criminal offense known as impeding public officers, generally impeding a police officer, what the <laughs> statute covers. And I don't know if you can tell what's underlined and what isn't because of the green. But subsection A there is not underlined. That means it's existing law. So the existing law is subsection A, which basically provide, provides a three-year felony. You see that on line five. It's a three-year felony for anyone hindering an executive, judicial, law enforcement, civil, or military officer acting under authority of the state. So this adds a new specific uh, offense related to, and this is all connected to, if you think about what's been going on in the relief from abuse order section, I'll let the witnesses explain more precisely uh, this connection, but you'll see that based on the language that you probably recall that one of the um, aspects of the RFA section is that it uh, uh, requires relinquishment of uh, firearms under certain situations when the re relief from abuse order is served. And this relinquishment has to be done usually pursuant to the language you'll see is to instructions from a law enforcement officer. So that's sort of the operative language just to keep in the back of your mind. So this new offense is added or proposed to be added, I should say, that uh, specifically deals with the service of uh, relief from abuse orders under uh, that's the site on line 9, 15 BSA 1103 and 1104. So the offense is if you're a person who's present at a location during the lawful search for or seizure of a or removal of a fire pursuant to uh, an RFA order, is what that means. The person who's present when one of these orders is being uh, uh, executed, who refuses to obey instructions from a law enforcement officer to ensure the safe removal of firearms or to protect the safety of the officer or other persons, shall be, and then you have a two-year misdemeanor. So essentially, it's prohibited conduct for someone who um, is present at the location while the order is being served and doesn't obey law enforcement officer instructions. That's the new misdemeanor that's proposed. Uh, Thank you. Where did the um, where did the information for this new misdemeanor come from? In other words, sort of what's the how do we come up with sort of what the sentence would be? The definition. Of the crime? All proposed by the group that I mentioned. Is it is it um, 
is this just necessary because this is a something related to a civil order? Or what, what is the reasoning for this? And is it, are there other, um, you know, if I were to impede or not, uh, not follow instructions of an officer uh, executing a different type of search warrant, would there be a similar crime? My reading of, well, the first question is, what's the reason and purpose behind this? I'm going to defer to the advocates mm -hmm. for that. that. Part of the question. I, I don't. I, I didn't mean for what they put it in there for, but sort of like why a, why a, this type of misdemeanor, uh, why this penalty? Uh, and, and that may still be a refer to the advocates, but I didn't know if there's like you know some existing law that we're basing this off of. Not not that I did in okay. this case. No, it was purely a basis of their proposal. Okay. Yeah. But as far as uh, your well, second question. Well, maybe, well, it is within existing, it is, it's adding a new subsection to existing law. Right. Right, but there, there is a new crime being Very, created. Yeah. 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 yeah, I understood. I thought he was just asking why was this particular penalty chosen? Yeah. yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. Right. yeah. I'm just trying to figure out the, yeah. the, the basis of the crime. Right. So, but, but it, on the second part. Second part of the part question, question, I would read the f existing sub A. If you hinder a law enforcement officer acting under the authority of the state, um, executing a warrant would seem to me you're acting under the authority of the state. So I think that at least in some cases, uh, the execution of a warrant could be punished under a three-year three-year felony. Okay, so it may be a, a slightly lesser charge uh, under this particular uh, if you're acting under 1103 or 1104. Right. Why, why would the part two be necessary then? I if think it's covered under A. I think it's a matter of sometimes it may be covered in, you know, this says uh, person present on the location because it might not always be a warrant. See, if I'm understanding relinquishment correctly. Sometimes the officer will come back and got a warrant. But remember the way the, the 1103 and 1104 are proposed to be set up. Um, there wouldn't necessarily be a warrant the, the, under certain circumstances. I think if I remember the one, we can look at the language. If, uh, for example, if the, that's the final order, if there's evidence that the defendant is in, possesses or right. controls firearms, it's not necessarily a warrant, in other words, so. But they're, uh, they're required to, they're required to relinquish. I understand that. But going back to the other part, if I'm a person present and you don't have a warrant, and I say, no, you can't come into the house. Right. Have I just committed a crime? Uh, while the officer is uh, executing an order, an RFA order under 1103 or 1104? Mm -hmm. <coughs> potentially, yeah. I'd say potentially. So we're... Uh, assuming that... Yeah, you gave it the other word. You said you can't come into the house. Right. Yeah, potentially. So let's, let's say, look at line 10. Uh, if the officer instructs the person, say, to, in fact, I think you could look at the definition here. Ensure the safe removal of firearms or protect the safety of the officer. Includes instructions in requiring the person to temporarily vacate a location. So I think, yeah, if the officer says to the person, So we're Step waiting out of the the house. requirements for a warrant in this particular situation for. We're basically saying that if you don't have a warrant, then I say you don't have a warrant, so therefore you're not coming into my house. We're now creating a crime. Uh, assuming the officer has, an, has the order. Has that order. Yeah. Okay, but in that particular instance, a warrant under this legislation would not be necessary, it sounds like. Correct. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So if, if a person is just in that house, and they don't know where the guns are. And this person's asked if he knows where the guns are, and they find out more. Can that person can find more guns? Is that <coughs> person considered a, a hinder and could be arrested because they don't know if he's lying or not? So had they stared at, sorry again, say sort of the sequence of facts there? So you so got someone in the house. There's a, there's a person in the house, right. say a relative. Oh, right. I'll narrow it down a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Right? He, he goes and says, I know where this gun is, I know where that gun is. 
right? And then there's other guns that he didn't know about, but they find him. They find uh, more guns. Couldn't he be considered hindering to this? Did the person, the never, did the person never know? Well, did, how you, how I mean, assuming I'm under your, let's assume for the, for the moment that the person didn't know about the other ones. As yeah. opposed to yeah. intentionally not telling. Right. I think the distinction of hindering is, turns on intent. So I would read, I, I'll do a little more research for you on this. But, but a, court, a court will tear that <coughs> apart. Well, did he know or didn't he know, right? Well, I think you're right that a court, they would look at uh, if there's any facts that the person actually didn't know, yeah, potentially different situation. But I would read hindering as an intentional uh, attempt to uh, impede an investigation, and that would require some knowledge. So if the person knew and didn't say, I'd say that could be hindering. Um, the person never knew, just didn't know about it, uh, I'm not so sure. Well, just a clarification. Um, at what point can an officer enter a house? That's a very broad question. That I, um, you know, there's all kinds of answers to that. that uh, certainly, there may an officer can enter a house with a warrant. Officer no, no, I mean, in this with this bill. Oh, oh, oh I say, gotcha. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. So if I show up with an RFA, can I enter the house? Oh, I see what you mean. You have a lawfully executed order that says, uh, um, if, the, if the order says that the person's got to leave the premises, for example, which could be part of the order, then uh, I would think the officer could enter the house, enter the house to effectuate the order. So search and seizure. With no uh, not necessarily search the house, but direct the person to leave. Yeah. Okay, then uh, at, at what point can they uh, search, search the house for firearms? You mean under the proposal that you're looking at? Yes. Right. I think the, the way it's framed up is that the uh, possession of firearms by a person who's subject to either an emergency or final order is being made illegal under the bill, right? I mean, the proposal is, I think, section four, that, yeah, here it is. Um, actually, no longer section four. But the bill proposes this, this new crime, right, of a person who's subject to a temporary or final relief from abuse order can no longer possess a fire, right? Mm -hmm. So the officer has probable cause to believe that the person actually does have a firearm. That's probable cause to believe that a crime is being committed. So in that situation, ordinarily, uh, you would, the officer would be required to go get a warrant, but if there's some exigent circumstances, maybe the, the officer suspects that the firearms are gonna be uh, hidden or taken away so, or something like that. It's possible that they could they so can the enter potential is, is definitely there, and, and I see it as a high potential that somebody's house could uh, be searched and have their fire, their personal property confiscated without a warrant. If there, it would, it would it could happen. It's possible, but again, yeah, I think it would have to fit into one of the exceptions to the warrant requirements that we which talked is, about before. Which is current law. The warrant would put your yeah. That's not changed by this, right? Right. The you know ordinarily you have to get probable cause and a warrant. If they have probable cause to think that the person's got firearms and they're therefore violating the law, then they're in order not to have to get a warrant, would have to fit into one of those exceptions we've talked about: exigent circumstances, plain view, consent. A person could consent to it. Um, uh, hot pursuit, just a species of exigent circumstances. They have to fit into one of those existing exceptions to the warrant requirement in order for the officer not to have to go to the warrant. And do, um, do we have any other laws where, I mean, this starts out as a civil, a civil thing where somebody ends up being charged with a two-year felony? Shall be, I think it's a shall. Yep. I mean, yes, it's a shame. 
Yeah. I'm not sure off the top of my head. I can look into that one right now. I'm not sure about the connection between the civil violation and a, and a criminal penalty. Um, I do think that violation of a, a violation of a VAP or a violation of an abuse prevention order, which I think is a civil order, but I'm not 100% sure, that is a crime currently. So, um, if this stays in, I, mean, I think shall be in prison is pretty stiff for that situation. So. I just want to make sure I understand this. Um, so, in the situation where, uh, looking at the language on page four, line eight and nine, mm -hmm. uh, specifically line nine, in the situation where there's removal of firearms pursuant to 15 BSA section 1103, it's my understanding that essentially that is the individual consenting or one of the other exceptions to the warrant requirement. You know, they go and they serve the, the uh, order, presumably they ask about relinquishment at that point. If they consent, then uh, they proceed and the person then has to obey the instructions from a law enforcement officer, which is defined on the next page on page five, uh, lines 13 to 19, which actually defines what that term instructions from a law enforcement officer uh, means. Um, so that would be that situation. The other is a fairly straightforward seizure. That means there has been a warrant and probable cause. So in that instance, they have to follow the instructions of a law enforcement officer. Do, do I have that right? Is that? I'm not sure that I read that as always, always having consent. Well, or one law of the other, one of the other exceptions. During the lawful search for or seizure or removal of a firearm pursuant to an order. So I suppose, yes, because of the term lawful, well, similar to what I'd said earlier, that, that uh, in order for it to be not pursuant to a warrant, um, it has to be fitted to one of the exceptions. Right? Can, can this be, can we add some language that clarifies that? Since that seems to be some ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. So could you describe what a lawful removal of a firearm? Forget the word search. Because there's a lot of ors in there. I'm trying to figure out sort of when the lawful removal kicks in. Well, so let's say, for example, the order required relinquishment. Right. And they go to the residence mm -hmm. and the person says, all right, I got these two firearms. Officer would remove them. That would seem like a removal situation to me. Right. And I assume that's what the language refers to. But they would have to have it. So they'd be consent? Or, but well, they wouldn't even necessarily enter the residence, necessarily. So, um, so let's play it out. So you come, there's now an order against me, requires relinquishment. Right. The officer comes to my door for a lawful removal of those. And, you know, we'll take out the, we'll just say there's no order to vacate, so it's not, you know, I'm still at the house that I'm allowed to be at. Obviously, I'm not allowed to have those firearms under this bill. Mm -hmm. But you get to the door and I say no. What happens? Uh, I would think at that point that the question becomes whether the officer has probable cause to think that, uh, when you say no, do you, do you say, yes, I have firearms, but I'm not giving them to you, or no, I don't have any? Play out both. Right. I think if it were, no, I don't have, in either case, probably, unless some exception to the warrant requirement applies, the officer's gonna have to go back to court and get a warrant. Um, unless an exception applies. So maybe there's some kind of exigent circumstances or some, something under the, under the particular facts of a given case that lead the officer to reasonably conclude that unless the firearms are seized right then, uh, you're gonna lose them. Um, right, what I'm concerned about is if I say no, right. I don't have any. You don't have a warrant, but you do have an order issued under one of those two, I forget which one. Yeah. But I'm now, so the officer says I'd like to come in to look, 
And I'd say no. Right, you don't consent. Then I've refused to obey instructions from a law enforcement officer to ensure the safe removal of firearms. Am I committing a crime under this new misdemeanor? And therefore, I'll, I, I shall be in, in prison or fine. One of the two has to happen, or both. So you guys see what you're saying. You're the, you're the person subject to the order. You right. Are. And uh, you're present during the attempted removal. You decline your consent. I say I don't have any, and I say right. you can't come in. Right. And if the officer then gives you instructions to um, step aside. Though. Right. It may technically be true. I'd, I'd be interesting question for the witnesses as to whether that's the intended sweep of this, because it may be that this is only intended to get at other people who may be impeding the officer from uh, the search. But you may be right. That it's pretty broad with the like, person present. Yes, yes, it's I the agree. way it's written. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Or, I mean, let's say other people. So you have something, and you. The, the uh, you know you come to the door and and uh, there's an order against me but I'm not there. Right. Barbara's there and she says no. I don't know of any guns here and you're not coming in. But even if that's a person present, that she could get caught up in that too. It seems in the same scenario by the same reading. Right. So just some concerns. But thank you. So, so, I mean, I definitely think we have to make very clear that we're talking about a lawful removal, or we could say lawful relinquishment, and, and that means that one of the war exceptions has applied. Because then I think even the situation where it's not the person subject to the war, that person, unless they own that property and they own the firearms, can't consent to them coming in pursuant to that relinquishment order. Um, but I guess Eric, the main thing is I think we need. My understanding has not been to allow searches and seizures uh, absent a warrant or an exception to the warrant. And I think that this obviously shows there's some ambiguity that that's not clear. Right. At least that's my, been my understanding. I'd like to hear from the witnesses what they've thought. Take another question. Just uh, sorry, a quick clarification. So I. I think uh, Representative Treber brings up a valid point, but I also think that it's, I mean, the, the majority of people lie to the police when they encounter them, and at least from my experience, and it's extremely difficult to prove that. And so it's not as if if a person just says no, that they're automatically getting charged with this crime, because you have to prove intent, and proving intent is a very, Difficult challenge. Do you have to prove intent by this language? If I wanted, if hypothetically I was the cop and I needed to build probable cause, which you need to charge somebody with a crime, I, I would want intent. I'm only reading refuses to obey instructions. <clears throat> and I'm just talking about the necessary elements you need for when you make I, your arrest. I get it, but it probably isn't that hard of a bar to prove that I'm refusing to obey instructions for probable cause for that, or intent that I'm intending to refuse to obey instructions. <coughs> I'm not sure. I don't have anything to add on that. Didn't I also hear uh, language that said attempting or attempt to remove firearms, but I don't see it. Was that just said, but it's not in here? It's not in there now. I don't know if it was said. Is it, 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 it said, said or am I just hearing things? Do you want me to answer <laughs> Voices, lots of voices. Yeah. Were you talking about the existing law portion? Just in this section right here. Which one? Is and well, I'm not, I'm not seeing it there, and that's why I'm questioning. I thought attempt to remove is what I heard said, but I'm not seeing it in this language. 
Yeah, it's not in there. Okay. So that, unless there are more questions about this proposed new offense, we can move on to the the next part. Now, now we're now in the. Uh, Relief from abuse order section because the, the new crime was in Title 13, which is where the crimes are. So now we're related to the orders themselves, not what you know someone allegedly hindering the removal of a firearm, but the orders themselves. And you remember that this proposal was to add a couple of definitions to the orders. And I'm going to skip forward just a second so you can see. And when we redraft this, uh, probably would be better to reorder these sections so that the language comes prior to the definitions. But I'm going to move forward a little bit. <coughs> See where the language comes in. Um, that's going to be. So remember that if the order, and I'm on line 13 now, if the order requires relinquishment of firearms, there are a couple of things that have to be in this RFA order if it requires relinquishment, because not all of them do, but if they do, there's some other provisions that have to be in the order as well. So, first of all, you see, there's just one word added to the information about the firearm, just the number of the firearm, in addition to the type of location. But in addition, subdivisions uh, 2 and 3, Roman numeral 2 and 3, lines 16 and 18, requirements that the defendant relinquish firearms pursuant to the instructions of a law enforcement officer. And three, require the defendant to provide the law enforcement officer with some information, again, specifics, location of firearms, keys, combinations, locks, et cetera. Um, and any other information that will assist the officer in the expedited access retrieval of delivery firearms subject to relinquishment. Now, again, this is in response to uh, information requested by the officer. But um, the key phrase is line 16 and 17, require the defendant to relinquish the firearms, relinquish firearms, pursuant to the instructions of the law enforcement officer. I just wanted to highlight that phrase because that's what's defined up above. Relinquishment means to give up. Pursue, everybody see where I am, line eight at the top of the page? So these, these are defining the terms that we just saw, de defining what has to be in the order. Because um, the order has to provide for relinquishment of the firearm pursuant to the instructions of the law enforcement officer. Well, what do those terms mean? The proposal is relinquishment means to give up pursuant to the instructions of a law enforcement officer, possession or control of a firearm to a cooperating law enforcement agency, approved dealer or third party approved by the court. And that's the other statute that covers third party uh, holding firearms by a person subject to one of these orders. And instructions of the officer includes instructions related to location of the firearms, production of location, production or location of keys, sorry, combinations to locks for firearm safes and doors, time, place, manner, and conditions of relinquishment, and any other information that will assist the officer um, in expedited uh, access for treating delivery. So that is an attempt to, I think, uh, flesh out the definitions of these terms that are defining what has to be in the order. Matt? Yeah. So before you move on there, yeah. I, I understand all of that. I'm just wondering, can we require, can we compel someone to comply with lines 15 to 16? Um, I think that the the there's perhaps an argument that the person could <coughs> assert a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination in those circumstances. Right. But that would be sort of an as-applied situation. You know what I mean? That that uh, they might choose that, they might not. Uh, so who's they're 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 doing this to law enforcement, so they're not in court anymore, right? So we're not making a judge do this. I know there was concern about having someone in the court getting someone to potentially self-incriminate. Right. But this is asking a law enforcement officer. But there could be some, okay. Potential, I'm not. Potentially, potential. someone could argue that right. they're being asked to self-incriminate. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, so basically there's this cycle or this circle where if somebody uh, chooses to plead the fifth and does not provide the information to law enforcement, then they'll be arrested for impeding. Is that is that correct? Uh, well, I think that goes back to the question about impeding as to who was that intended to cover. 
whether it's you know the person who's refusing to provide the firearms because they actually are his or her own firearms, or whether it's some other person who's present in the location who's hindering this this attempt to remove them. Um, but I think under a literal reading of it, yeah, you're right. It would seem to seem at least the literal language would seem to cover both some other person at the location and the person him or herself. And then, so that person pleads the fifth, gets arrested, then the cops would have to get a search warrant, mm -hmm. right, in order to conduct their search? Oh, to go back to the premises and, right. and search for the firearms? Yeah, that's right. Unless there was some exception, some emergency that gave rise to an exigent circumstance. But, but barring that, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, the language we were just looking at, the definitions for purposes of the order themselves. So, we're going to move on to the substance of the orders. Again, this is the final order. And we've sort of gone through sort of different formulations of this language of what will trigger relinquishment. Remember, initially, there was all orders would have relinquishment. Then in the blue, the first uh, uh, first iteration of the language, if there's evidence that the defendant is in possession or has access to firearms, then the order of relinquishment. This proposal now is in green. If there's evidence that the defendant possesses, owns, or controls firearms, then relinquishment is ordered. And that sort of true, possesses, owns, or controls formulation is the same sort of series of words that have been used throughout the bill in different circumstances. So, I think the idea here was it made more sense to be consistent with the terminology of when relinquishment is ordered. Thanks for clarifying that. That, mm -hmm. that change helps a lot. Note that the word owned, though, is struck from, because th this applies not only to firearms that the defendant possesses, owns, or controls, but that another person has on behalf of the defendant. And upon further analysis, I think it became obvious that another person may possess it or control it on behalf of the defendant, but they're not going to own it on behalf of the defendant. In that case, there isn't really the same concern. So that word is struck. This we just went through. We, I skipped forward a little bit. Remember, this is what if the order requires relinquishment, what has to be in the order? You're adding information about the number of firearms. Um, requiring that the defendant relinquish pursuant to the law enforcement officer's instructions and provide the LEO with various information about location, keys, combination locks, et cetera. That all has to be in the order. That was, a t that was the final order. You see the emergency order. This is all just exactly the same. That's what we just looked at. Same thing that you add, you take out the uh, possession of or has access to and replace it with possesses, owns, or controls, but strike the word owns when you're referring to somebody else other than the defendant. Same language again here that has to be in the, the temporary order as well. Um, uh, if the, if the uh, order requires relinquishment, then there has to be a specific language requiring relinquishment and for the defendant to provide the LEO with various information that we just described. You'll see that uh, lines 12 through 17 are struck. This is connected to the issue of once served, always served. Remember, we were discussing that issue of uh, being able to serve the person by first class mail after initially being, after they've been personally served the first time. Uh, that, you'll see later on, is being struck completely. So they're not going to take a, the ability to serve by mail and to count. Uh, to serve the person by mail, particularly if they've been personally served the first time, all that is struck. So therefore, these notifications that involve that are struck also. No need to have them. Sorry, to clarify. So all the discussion in this draft around the once served, always served, and the notification in all the sections that relate to it, that's gone. We're now back to basic service for all these. Correct. Things Correct. in this draft. Yep. Okay. Can I turn over this way? I don't know what the, there was a lot of concern with the group in the past about um, speed and finding people. Do you know what changed in this draft for that? Yeah, it's um, coming up, I believe. I'm sorry? I think it's coming up. I'm to, like, um, thought process behind it, not just the law, so. Uh, the thought process was, 
the, the concerns really from Judge Grierson and, okay. and his proposal of uh, instead having the temporary order stay in effect until the permanent order or final order is served. Okay. That, that's the, that, that was what his, it was the judge's suggestion. Okay. Thank you. And that language is right there, page 13. So the ex parte temporary order remains in effect until it's either dismissed or the petition is denied at the final hearing. And one of those two things will always happen. Either it will be dismissed and the final order will go into effect or it will be denied altogether. Uh, and if the final order is issued, then the temporary order remains in effect until personal service of the final order. And again, all the stuff about striking all this language we just referred to, the first class mail, all that stuff is out. Uh, now this has to do, we're now moving on to the return of service. So remember that's the, uh, uh, the form that when the order is served, the return of service form has to go back to the court and tell the court the RFA has been served and here's what happened. And it has this details what information has to be in that return of service form. Uh, you see there's a, a couple of things. You've struck some and included others under the proposal, but now the language sitting in front of you says, uh, how many firearms were relinquished by the defendant at the time of service? So at the time the order is served, how many firearms were relinquished has to be in this, has to be um, stated in the return. <laughs> as well as subdivision two now, that in green, whether the law enforcement officer has attempted to contact the plaintiff after service of the order and prior to the return being filed to the court. Remember, you'll see as we get to it, in, a, in the previous version, it had required that the law enforcement officer contact the plaintiff, that was the proposal. That struck, so there's no requirement that the, that the LEO contact the plaintiff, but if the, such, if the contact does happen, or, or sorry, the, uh, whether or not the officer made that attempt has to be just stated one way or the other in the return. Well, not a requirement that they do, but it just has to be stated. And that's, uh, I think, the, so now those are the two provisions that have to be in the return. How many firearms are relinquished and whether the LEO tried to contact the plaintiff. The court has to provide a copy to the plaintiff. And then after, this is subdivision C in green, line 13, after the law enforcement officer has made those indications, in other words, after they've indicated on the return, uh, how many, how many um, uh, firearms were relinquished and whether or not the plaintiff was contacted, uh, then the return of service is filed at the earliest possible time, takes precedence over other summons and orders. Uh, there's some clarification language, 16 and 18, they're just saying that if, if, if they don't actually make those indications, that's not going to affect the validity of the service. In other words, the defendant can't argue the service wasn't valid because it doesn't contain some information about how many firearms I had or whether the plaintiff was contacted. Um, now, so that's the return of service. Next step, remember, is the warrant. So. Again, uh, there's been a lot of iterations of the warrant requirement as we've gone through different versions of this bill and committee. The one you're looking at here, in a sense, just um, just uh, sort of explicitly states what the what current law would be, which is that the court may issue the warrant uh, under the subsection for seizure of firearms in response to an application filed under Rule 41, which is the way the procedure currently works now. That's the rule that governs filing an application for a search warrant. Um, and that's it. So the may, so if that basically the, the implication there is that uh, the application for the warrant has to be filed under Rule 41, which is the process that happens anyway. And all they see the struck language had included some specifics about, well, the court can issue this warrant if it finds probable cause to believe, and then it listed some of these things. But those were, you may recall, originally came out of this New Jersey Supreme Court case that was tied to the fact that this was a civil warrant. But since the court uh, isn't doing that anymore, and it's only issuing warrants in response to Rule 41 of the Rules of Criminal Rule of Procedure, you don't really need that language anymore either. So that's it. And what you have left is really just what the current process would be anyway. Uh, 
And we're now moving on to immunity. Remember, that's another another topic which has to, which essentially means uh, providing the law enforcement officer to act under uh, these chapters to serve these warrants, uh, serve the execute the warrants rather, serve the orders, that sort of thing with immunity. And that means they can't be sued, can't be sued civilly or prosecuted criminally uh, for some of their conduct, and you see some, there's some tweaking there. The, the blue language you'd already looked at last time, there's a little bit of tweaking in green that, um, again, you have the sort of general immunity for, for this is like 11 and 12, for acts undertaken or omissions made in good faith reliance on the provisions of this chapter, rather than section, because this chapter is more inclusive. Yeah, just is, is there any substantive substantive difference between the words section and chapter. Yes. Yep. It's uh, chapter includes all the sections in this in the in the chapter. This section would be just acting under on, pursuant to uh, uh, the service and warrant section, the section right. 1105. By including chapter, you are referring to the 1103 and 1104 also primarily, which is the actual service of the RFAs, the service of the orders. So they get immunity for acts they take in good faith reliance on the law that governs their service of these orders. It seems pretty wide. Is that, and I'm assuming the intent is to be wide. The intent of the proposers is wide. Um, yeah, I think it, it is do, broad. Do yeah. we, in other places where we put immunity in, are we that broad, or are we typically putting immunity for law enforcement into a more targeted area? I think, and I'll, I can show you a couple of examples, I think good faith reliance on the provisions of a given law is not uncommon. I can think of the drone statute has similar language when uh, I think the um, the electronic communications privacy has similar language. So <coughs> I, I think that providing immunity is the exception, not the rule, but that when you do do it, that language is not mutual. That's, I guess, the way I may respond. Okay. Hmm? I'll let you pick this one up. <laughs> You're going to love it. <laughs> so in the part that Matt just raised, <clears throat> the way it's written now, it almost looks like we're giving immunity whether, I mean, it doesn't talk about the good faith attempt unless it does from up above. Because if a law enforcement officer just was like, what the heck, I'm not going to go do this, we're giving them immunity. Right. Uh, no, I, would, I think that the that that language is key on line twelve. It has to be made in good faith. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So like a right. Okay. An intentional disregard of the law. I would right. argue. Okay. Probably not good faith. Right. All right. No, I missed yeah. seeing that. Thank you. Yeah. So this doesn't circumvent the current provisions related to sovereign immunity for the police. I mean it. Because they, they already have immunity unless there's uh, gross negligence or willful misconduct, right? And so yeah. this doesn't circumvent those elements, right? If you mean supersede. Yeah, that's probably right. Right, right. I think it does. Sorry. It does. That's the way I read it. Uh, yes, I think under existing law, you're right. There, there's a, uh, a body of law for when law enforcement have immunity. And I think. My reading of this is that it is broader than that and provides immunity in addition to what exists under current law. So can I just provide a quick hypothetical scenario? Yeah. So let's say a cop has a grudge against a person who, and he's executing an RFA, or I'm sorry, he's executing one of these orders to seize the firearms. He takes the gun and intentionally damage it, damages it just because he doesn't like this person because they have a history of some sort, that will make him immune from the willful misconduct exception from sovereign immunity? 
No, because I, I think in that case, it still wouldn't meet the good faith reliance test. Okay. Uh, this on, on line right. 12. Okay. It right. still wouldn't be immune. But, the, but I, th I think there might be situations, I can't come up with them off the top of my head, but there might be situations that um, potentially a person, an officer might not be immune under uh, existing law, that they might be immune here. Not sure, but, but they're, sometimes they're going to be the same, like the example you just gave. Certainly not an intentional destruction of property. No way that's good faith reliance on the statute. I right. wouldn't be immune to that. Okay. Right. So, well, I mean, so there are some. I guess I'm not sure how one can be acting in good faith if they're grossly negligent either, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. The other standard right now under current laws, gross negligence. Yeah, potentially. Potentially. Um, so does everybody get a sense of the what the immunity provisions are there? So again, that you're adding the proposal is to add also. Uh, the word search for, not just failing to learn of locate or seize a firearm, but failing to search for uh, subdivision two, you added returning a seized or relinquished firearm. So again, because sometimes a firearm is given up voluntarily, relinquished, it's not just the seizing that would kick in at the immunity. And there's some language added, proposed to be added here, you see subdivision B, line 17, uh, chapter, it's a very similar concept, should not be construed to create a legal duty for a law enforcement officer or agency to a plaintiff or any other person. Again, a duty would give rise to an ability to be sued. So since there's no legal duty, they can't be sued. Um, no action can be filed against the officer based on a claim for which there's no liability. In other words, if there's immunity, you can't file a lawsuit against the person. So let's... Eric, yep. so, so how does this uh, interact with the uh, current law under um, the provision 23, uh, 20 BSA 2307? The immunity provision of that one? Yeah, H, where that has to do with uh, seizure storage of firearms. Yep. And that one specifically talks about recklessness, gross negligence, or intentional misconduct right. uh, if deterioration of the firearms occurred because of that. Is that still in place for the storage component, or does this somehow conflict with that? I haven't examined that in great detail, uh, but I, if that provision, which I don't know, applies specifically to the storage, whereas this doesn't, which nothing here, I think, does cover storage, then yes, I would say that provision still applies to storage, that level of immunity. It's stored or transported for right. to the section, which But it doesn't cover seized or... No, just a stored or uh, transported. Yes, then that, I think that's right, then. So this, this level of immunity would apply to the seizure and the removal, whereas the storage and the transport would seem to be covered by 2307. Yeah. And that's a distinction that you mentioned that I believe is probably similar to the sovereign immunity that uh, <laughs> you're talking about, um, is that uh, there are exceptions for gross negligence and intentional misconduct in 2307, if I remember right, mm -hmm. whereas there aren't here. language actually, 4A and B, um, I think it's similar to that language in 2307 as well. Noticing this is something that I have not noticed before. Um, 
which is that as originally, this language has been in there from the beginning. This is the existing, this is the, and this language tracks the immunity language represented on that you were just mentioning. And uh, I think that was originally in the bill to provide a level of immunity. But now, since in this new draft, you're proposing, the proposal is to add uh, more detail about the immunity, you may want to strike that. It's about to avoid it. It's been back in for a while. No, this is the new cup. That makes sense. That's true. It's back in. It's B, I mean, A can probably stay. That doesn't really talk about immunity. It's just saying that, yeah. that okay. so it's B. more of a method, of, a method, but B about immunity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now you've got it potentially inconsistent in two places. So probably want to strike that. Yeah. yeah. So last week, it seems like we were talking about the number of firearms that could potentially uh, be confiscated. And I don't remember who said it, but somebody said something about a U-Haul storage unit, potentially to oh to put, what's that? It's probably BPA, maybe. So anyway, under the, this immunity, say if it came that there was a, a thousand firearms at somebody's house, and, and the, uh, the only place that they could you know, get them to right off was a U-Haul storage unit. And they brought them to U-Haul. They put them in the storage unit, and um, and somebody <laughs> broke in and stole them because it's it's not going to be as safeguarded as a uh, police station or whatever. Is where is it? Is what's the story on immunity there? Um, or even if somebody broke into the police station and stole them, I guess it really wouldn't matter. It's really going to turn on. Lines 14 and 15. Um, if the damage or deterioration occurred as a result of recklessness, gross negligence, or intentional misconduct by the law enforcement, so it's really if it was if it was ordinary negligence, just you know, say they, and again, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, you can sort of put a couple of hypothetical facts out there as to what can sometimes turn on the difference between. Uh, negligence and gross negligence or recklessness. So let's say, for example, the uh, law enforcement agency knew that there had been break-ins at that particular facility before and uh, had uh, not properly secured a particular storage facility, then I'd say that would probably rise to the level of recklessness and gro gross negligence they wouldn't be immune. On the other hand, but say they didn't, and it was a it was a one time. They had, didn't have any evidence that it happened before. Um, uh, there was no reason to think that necessarily the robbery would happen this in this particular facts. They'd probably be immune. That's probably probably no negligence there. Yeah. So, then I think we can. It's been said enough. We can pretty much expect that more firearms are going to be confiscated with this bill. So, if a if law enforcement doesn't have the proper storage for these, uh, and there's deterioration, um, and let's just go with deterioration mm -hmm. because there's not proper storage. Isn't that in itself recklessness and gross negligence by confiscating these things and not having a proper place to? to uh, store them? Interesting question. I don't know, maybe. I, I see what you're saying. That if, like, if, they, if, they, if they're aware that they don't have proper storage that will not prevent deterioration, is that conscious disregard of a known risk? Arguably. But that well, interesting thing, that's existing law. Like that, th this provision, that provision is in Title yeah. 2307 already. The, yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess at this point, regardless of existing law. Right, right. And to me, it would be reckless to, uh, uh, I'll go back to U-Haul, and they say they're climate controlled. Well, maybe they're, the climate is, uh, uh, the humidity's too high, and, and they're climate controlled. So. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I have to ask you a question, don't I? <laughs> so there's no facilities out there at all that's equipped to handle 
what fire, firearms could possibly be confiscated from this bill. That's why the U-Haul, I assume, got brought up, right? Because there's not enough. I think that's a question for, yeah. I don't think that's a legal question for Eric pertaining to the wall. <coughs> right. Yeah. Right. I don't and, that's, and that's a question for, um, for instance, the commissioner who talked about taking care of storage, and that storage is, um, according to his testimony, no longer an issue. But that is not a, that's not a question for Eric to answer. So I think that brings us to, that's the end of the RFA section, and that brings us to the extreme risk protection order for this section. You remember that uh, Representative Donahue was in testifying about that, and that's uh, in response to that testimony and discussion that the committee had, but we will see new language on page 20. And this has to do with uh, emergency ERPO orders, emergency temporary relief orders that, uh, you remember the proposal is that the ERPO extreme risk protection order um, can be filed for, uh, not just by the state's attorney or the AG, but by a family or household. That's the proposal in uh, the bill, the most recent amendment to the bill. And Representative Donahue uh, was in here, and after that discussion, some language has been added to make clear that when the petition is filed, the emergency petition, uh, is filed by a family or household member. So this only applies when it's filed by a family or household member, not when it's filed by a state's attorney or the attorney general. In that case, though, uh, when the family or household member does file it, it can only be based on an allegation, I'm on line four now, that the petitioner poses an imminent and extreme risk of causing harm to another person. And shall not be based on an allegation that the respondent poses an imminent and extreme risk of causing harm to himself or herself. See, generally speaking, ERPOs can be based on either one causing extreme risk of harm to another person uh, or to him or herself. And this sort of carves out an exception to that and says, well, if it's the family member filing it, it can only be based on risk of harm to another person, uh, not to the person himself or herself. Anybody get that? Any questions for uh, let's see if there's anything else even in here. I don't believe there are. Nope. So that's it as far as the changes between draft 7.1 and draft 6.1. Any mm -hmm. questions for Eric? That's why. Hey. Yeah, let's take a 10-minute break. Well, it's not a question <laughs> about this language, but I'm just wondering if you or someone else can um, direct. I think the citation that Representative Donahue shared led to, like, uh, somewhere <laughs> other than she intended about existing law around involuntary commitment, mm -hmm. ass essentially, mm -hmm. and how it would intersect. I think she was making the case that, um, so anyway, I'm just. That there could still would, be, if I remember correctly, there could still be involuntary commitment of a person uh, based on a petition of an interested party because the person is at risk of causing harm to themselves, I think is what she was saying. Right. Right. That even though you couldn't have this and firearm. Can you just tell me where? Uh, it's time. in Title 18. 18, uh, say 7505. Oh, okay. Thank nice. you. Just <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> right. Well done. On this piece of paper. <laughs> I guess I would say, I, don't, I mean, I don't think I need this right now from your watch rail, but just as we move into further discussion on this, I would really want to understand more about that provision and how it I'm going to be extremely brief, but I would welcome any questions. It's been represented in <clears throat> email, I'm sorry, Bill Moore, Vermont Traditions Coalition Firearms Policy Analyst. It's been represented in emails from the leadership uh, that our uh, organization opposes this bill in all its elements. That's accurate. Um, I have repeatedly turned down the offer and opportunity to testify because of this being such a moving target. Uh, 
Eric Davis on behalf of Gun Owners of Vermont and Chris Bradley, twice, three times now, have testified to all the technical aspects, all the constitutional concerns that I could possibly repeat. I've just spent a lot of time going over their recent testimony in particular to make sure that I can make that statement accurately. My concern from the beginning of this process has been that an individual civil right, a God-given natural inalienable right as described in the Heller decision as an individual right, if anyone harbors any collective right illusions, you should dispel those. But this individual right is being treated to a disbarment, to a separation, to an alienation in constitutional terms through a civil action with no representation in a non-adversarial process because the defendant is not present, not welcome to be present, nor is he invited to provide any representation on his own behalf or her own behalf, as the case may be. So we have a civil matter to issue an RFA. These are very important civil proceeds. They're meant to be streamlined and effective for one purpose and one purpose only, to separate two individuals, one of whom may be a danger to the other. As this, these advocates will testify, and a good attorney, that is a finely tuned process, which has been tested in the courts over the years for its constitutionality. I'm not here to dispute that. I'm actually here to support it. Law enforcement has stated repeatedly, and I believe at times some members of the court, that confusing that process and making it more complicated hinders its ability to respond in a timely manner to offer the protection that the RFA and other similar orders are designed to offer. Which gets back to my underlying premise with this bill. You have an inherent inalienable individual constitutional rights similar to that of freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to worship, that is being subjected to scrutiny and alienation from an individual in a civil process. Again, forgetting that we're complicating the re relief from abuse order system. We're talking about a constitutional right. This is so similar to the civil rights violations that were treated upon post-Reconstruction blacks in the South, where things grew out of those errant laws without due process, without a criminal court, without representation, such as not allowing them to have firearms, such as not allowing them to vote, such as tests for voting rights. I don't think it's a reach for me to go into that realm and say, this is a very similar thing, where you take a civil matter, you take a low-level bureaucratic process, and try to apply it to something cherished in an individual right, which is now recognized by the court. If you, if you just simply take the Heller decision and read it, where the essence of that right is self-defense and essentially self-defense in the home, that should bring you up to a level of scrutiny that dis, just simply disbars you from applying this type of order in a civil process. It should be immediately elevated to where it is an individual who is notified of the threat <coughs> to have their rights removed in a court, offered some sort of representation, and informed of their rights previous. <coughs> we made an exception in the red flag law for ex parte orders. We grudgingly supported, or at least failed to oppose, that statute being instituted in Vermont for the simple reason that it did afford some due process. We fought for stronger due process, but this committee reduced that. The, the law did pass, and to some degree we support its ability to address those situations. The situations described in this bill should be addressed in ERPOs. They should be addressed in further criminal charges against a person who poses a threat. But to layer these two things on top of each other, an individual, right? If I came to you and said you've published a, a, a hate speech web blog and you're being charged and here's an order to cease and desist your publication 
under the law. And oh, by the way, we have an order here that says, I can take your computers, I can shut your network down, I can order that your servers are all, I'll deny you service. And by the way, we did this in a civil action. You weren't represented, you weren't even notified that it happened, you'd be shocked. I can only describe individual rights the way the Supreme Court has often described them. And that is that they are inherent, pre-existent, and unalienable. That means that without due process. This bill does not describe any due process. So that's my brief statement. I would like to hit on a couple of items before I, I end. It's impossible to prepare a testimony in any gory detail for a bill that changes once a week in a highly technical manner. Um, only attorneys can truly understand the, the gory details of it. Eric, poor Eric was put on the spot this morning. An added section, completely new to the bill. By the way, that this latest version, because it had an added section, completely new to the bill. I was just wondering what the vote count was to amend the bill in that order. What was the what was the vote to include that new section? Um, there haven't been any votes. Have there been any votes to hold the public hearing? Have there been any votes to do any of the amendments? At any stage of the game in this process? Well, Take that as a no. Well, it's still the public hearing. <clears throat> there have been no votes to amend the bill. No, the bill has I think not. That's a fair statement. It's, it's fair, but also the bill has not been amended. In any no, no, no amendment. So this is not the bill is introduced. These are all. These are all. They've yes, never been voted on. Correct. To no advance vote. them as as amendments. Correct. The bill, That's what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, six ten is still That's as all introduced. I'm saying. Yeah. So, just briefly on the new section, it's clear that. Uh, there hasn't been a detailed discussion on what the implications of creating this new crime are. It's also clear that it seems to attempt to create a warrantless search exception that may be actually applied on a person who happens to be present at the location <laughs> if a neighbor were there at the front doorstep when the RFA is being issued. And that person seemed to have some knowledge of firearms in the building but simply just stated what I said. I don't have any interest in helping you with this. I, I'm not going to answer your questions. I'm not going to give you any knowledge of firearms in the building. I could be charged under this. It creates a third party endangerment. It puts someone at peril of law up to two years who, until they step foot in front of the officer, uh, had no understanding whatsoever of the situation. At every single turn in the process of this bill, there's a complete lack of Fifth Amendment capability. In fact, it's almost an implicit denial of it. If you refuse under this new section to participate in producing information that could place you at peril of other charges, including the one described in this new section, uh, it's circular, it's a catch-22. You are putting yourself at peril by declaring your constitutional rights to not self-incriminate. This all under a civil order. The threat of a criminal order, the threat of a criminal charge, the threat of a justifiable warrant served by the court at the doorfront applies to the person and the specific, specific items, places, time, and manner the court issued the warrant under. You can't create an exception because someone refuses to participate in the <coughs> officer's service of that warrant. If they ask a question and someone doesn't answer it, you've created peril for that person. And they're in a, they're in a bind. Just, there were no answers to these questions this morning. Clearly, this has not been vetted. As to the remainder of the bill, I will simply repeat that we support the positions both expressed by the Federation and gun owners of Vermont, and that in order for this bill to move forward, 
It's time for some votes. It's time for you folks to vote on some of these sections by section as to whether or not you wish to have them to be part of the bill. We're looking at a public hearing where sign up begins in one hour. After six weeks, none of you have voted or gone on record as to which sections of this bill you propose to support or which amendments to which sections you propose to support. And I would submit to you that most of us on this side would not have wished to have a public hearing under these circumstances. And so the message you will hear tonight will be based on the best information that your citizens have at their disposal. And after this morning, I believe it's clear that even the committee members are not well informed of the implications of this bill. And with the new sections that aren't vetted, uh, I would submit again that, that the public hearing will only be an expression of outrage on the general principle of taking an individual right with no due process, no representation, no potential for self-protection against self-incrimination. It is going to be detrimental to not only the image, but the ability to serve these orders. And it will create confusion that will create danger for officers, as has been also testified to. There are so many other methods by which this committee, through its broad jurisdiction, could affect real help to the potential victims and the victims that are involved in these domestic disputes, not the least of which would be resources to assert some help in processing burpos in a timely manner. I, I leave you with this last comment. Um, I basically withdraw from supporting the ERPOs as long as the section of the bill that allows family members to bring them uh, remains. Um, we, are, we are now technically, as an organization, supportive of the ERPO concept, but it should be initiated only through officers of the court through due process with notification and ability to represent oneself. And if that is hindered or watered down in any way, uh, we can no longer support that, period. Um, I look forward to a lot of the technical problems with the new section being answered by smarter people than me, people with the technical training and judicial temperament to uh, speak to them, and at which time I would like to comment further. Thank you. Great. Okay. So we are continuing with H610. <laughs> um, welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, we had reviewed the VPA's proposal. Um, and we had no objection to uh, the, uh, to all of the sections, but we do, and I had not testified this to this yet, but I understand the committee is uh, curious about the impeding statute, and I did want to give uh, the Attorney General's Office's position on that. And um, our position is that the addition, uh, of the second section proposed to the impeding statute would be unconstitutional on its face. And that the reason for that is that it would be too vague. And so the constitutional doctrine that that implicates is void for vagueness. That's the term that the courts use. Um, there actually was a court case that came out just in 2019. And it was a court case interpreting the impeding statute as it currently exists. Um, yes, sorry, Vermont Supreme Court. Uh, interpreting Vermont's impeding statute as it currently exists. And the court noted in that case that in order to remain constitutional, the impeding statute does have to be read narrowly, because if it isn't read narrowly, it's potentially uh, criminalizing a lot of ordinary behavior, behavior that might happen somewhat routinely. Uh, in that case, a driver refused to turn over their license and registration upon request, which is itself a civil violation, not a criminal violation. 
um, and in doing so, it did hinder the officer's ability to carry out their job and did defy a lawful order. Uh, the court noted that on its face, that may uh, have violated the impeding statute. It said, look, it did two things that you need to have an, an impeding, impeding statute violation. Uh, one, it did uh, violate a law, and, in vi and the person did violate a law, and in violating that law, they uh, made, the, uh, made it so the officer couldn't carry out their duty. But the court said that because the impeding statute is a felony, and I realize that we're talking about a potential misdemeanor here, but because the impeding statute is a significant um, criminal liability, the statute read fairly cannot have meant that such a low-level violation, in, this case, in that case, the um, violation was a civil violation, a traffic inf uh, infraction. Um, it can't be the case that the legislature meant to include uh, such low-level behavior and turning it into a felony. And so they were basically saying, look, all the person did was do a traffic violation, and now you're making them a criminal. Uh, and they basically said, that, that can't be the case, and we don't read the statute that way. Where, so that's sort of actually all by way of background, and that's to say where the court went next with this statute was to say, or with this case, was to say, not only do we not read the statute that way, but we believe that we are constitutionally required to read the statute narrowly. Um, and they did an analysis of the void for vagueness doctrine. And again, they went back to the notion that if you read the impeding statute broadly, uh, under the plain terms of the impeding statute, it could criminalize uh, a lot of behavior that wouldn't otherwise be criminal, like just choosing not to tell an office or something. Something like that. If, again, if you read this broadly under plain terms, potentially including sweeping up a lot of behavior that we would normally think of as not being unlawful. Uh, and they noted the standards um, that they that they look to when interpreting void for vagueness. And so I'll read you one of them, one of the ways that they put it. The doctrine of void for vagueness, generally stated, requires that penal statutes define a criminal offense with sufficient certainty so as to inform a person of ordinary intelligence of conduct which is proscribed or forbidden and such that arbitrary and discrimin discriminatory enforcement is not encouraged. Under our reading of the current of, of the proposal uh, and the proposed addition to the impeding statute, it would subject somebody to criminal liability who is not, who has not broken a law, who is potentially lawfully in a residence or whatever the location might be, uh, isn't themselves subject to a relief from abuse order or any order, and ha maybe has not done anything except sat or stood in a place and not moved. It then becomes the officer's decision as to whether or not the officer subjectively believes that that person uh, presents a, a threat or you know, a, a threat to their safety or makes them unsafe. Then they can tell the person to do something, to leave the house, to stand there, to move, whatever it might be. And if the person disobeys that request, they would now be a criminal or potentially. Um, depending on how the court case proceeds. The issue with that is that any ordinary person who has not themselves broken the law, who is not themselves subject to an order, who has not made any affirmative move to impede an officer, has to make a guess as to whether or not this officer believes them to be a threat to safety or is just saying that they would prefer them to move or would rather them be somewhere else. And this there's two, there's sort of two sequential issues here. One is that the choice to subject somebody to criminal liability is solely within the officer's purview. The person cannot do or not or refrain from doing something to avoid potential criminal liability because it is solely within the officer's decision, subjective decision, as to whether or not this person poses a threat of safety. And then they give the order to make the request. And now that is what potentially makes the person uh, subject to criminal liability. But there's nothing that person can do. Again, they're, they're just there by whatever stroke of bad luck. And 
uh, they, they are now at the complete discretion of the officer as to whether they are potentially going to be subject to a crime. Now, they, of course, they won't actually be subject to a crime unless they disobey an officer's orders. But it will not necessarily be clear to a person. Uh, and I, so I would actually argue, let me stop right there and say, um, that by itself, the fact that criminal liability will only attach because of an officer's subjective belief about their own safety is by itself a, a significant constitutional problem. Because again, the person can't control anything about that. And that's the sort of basic standard we have when we talk about void for vagueness doctrine. A person has to be able to know or to know how to behave in order to avoid being a criminal or being charged with a crime. And here they really can't control it. They are where they are for whatever reason when this person comes in to serve a RFA order and there is nothing they can do to um, avoid an officer's concern, reasonable or not. So now an officer, and then I should say, so let me now move to the next step of the analysis. I'd say that we already have a significant constitutional concern. Secondary constitutional concern is that when the officer issues an order, that person does not necessarily know whether or not they are actually being issued an order or the officer saying, hey, you know, it would be better if you went over here. Now, is the officer in saying so motivated by a concern for their safety? If they are motivated by that, and again, this is in the officer's head, not necessarily something that an ordinary person can know what's going on in their head. If the, if the, um, if that is motivated by safety, now they are subject to the crime. If it wasn't motivated by a concern for the safety, if it was a request of convenience or whatever it might be, uh, well, now they aren't subject to the crime because in the officer's head, there, it was not an order motivated by a concern for their safety as required by the proposed statute. So you have a sort of secondary issue with respect to void for vagueness and ordinary individuals not knowing whether or not they are subject to criminal liability. Um, and, and again, there's a nice outline of all of this in uh, State v. Burrard, which is on point with respect to the impeding statute. Very recent case in 2019. And uh, I think that's a, a jumping off point for the committee. And we've certainly, now Burrard, again, I, I was about the current impeding statute, but it, but it is an important uh, signal in terms of how courts are going to interpret this in that it does require the current statute to be read narrowly. And we believe that a significant expansion, uh, as proposed here, um, would not be looked upon favorably by the courts and does have a void for bank problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say the case name again in the citation. Yes, uh, State v. Burrard, and I don't have the modern citation, but the old one will get 220A3D759. It's So um, my question is, I mean, it, it, this focus is on officer safety is, is what I'm gathering from this expansion. and. You know, what you're saying is that it's, as written, it's, it seems like it could be unconstitutional. So if this were to be changed and we were to put in writing that, to clarify that police at a scene like this have the authority to control the movement of people while executing this order, would that be considered unconstitutional? Off the top of your head, if you can. I mean, I, I hesitate to make those kinds of decisions without being able to read potential language. Um, I, I certainly understand the concerns about officer safety, and you know, we've, uh, we've worked very hard to address them and throughout the bill, and have made many changes to do so. Um, I think that with respect to serving the order. Uh, officers will certainly still retain discretion as to whether or not they should serve the order, whether they should apply for a warrant. They could certainly choose to do that. And once you're serving a warrant, officers have much more ability, constitutionally permissible ability to control the scene. Um, and that may be the prudent thing to do, and we understand that. <laughs> Thank you.
For the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, testifying to draft uh, 7.1 of H610. And unless the committee uh, chair indicates otherwise, I'll just confine my remarks to the new green sections. Um, and obviously, the first one deals with the issue that uh, Mr. Shear addressed a few minutes ago, as well as the uh, uh, prior two witnesses. As the committee knows, um, I cannot testify or don't offer testimony with respect to policy, uh, nor can I offer legal opinions. Um, no advisory opinion? No advisory opinion. Um, so I, I cannot comment on um, on uh, Mr. Shear's testimony or, or, the, or the prior witness's testimony as to the issue around the constitutionality of, I'm looking specifically at, on page four, uh, lines eight through 13. As I read the uh, bill, uh, that that would be new law, the preceding section, one the lines one through seven, is the existing, existing law. I, I think I can safely say that um, perhaps consistent with some of the testimony you've heard, uh, the way this language appears, it would certainly expand the net uh, of uh, individuals who could be subject to, to criminal um, prosecution if that remains in the bill. Having said that, and even having in mind the, the, the idea of expanding the net of potential criminal defendants, I do not see this as having a significant impact on cases coming into the court in the sense that do I expect there to be a high volume of, of cases um, with this charge. I would expect, as you've heard from, from the previous three witnesses, uh, something coming in under this provision would probably be very heavily litigated. Um, but I do not see in terms of volume that it would have a significant impact um, in that respect. Um, and I'll just continue to go along unless there are questions. I'm looking um, on page five, uh, which now adds a definition of relinquishment. Uh, which uh, certainly, um, both the law enforcement um, and the individual subject to the order to understand the obligations. What I would say is that if you're going to adopt that definition, um, I do not see the need for that same language. Um, I'm looking now at page seven. The order calls for that language to be included. And, and I don't think it's necessary that the language then appear. I think it's on page seven. Page seven. This is talking about the order. If I get this right. In other words, it's merely repeating all of the definition of relinquishment. So, if you've already ordered relinquishment as part of the order, uh, the definition would follow um, that order without the necessity of again repeating that uh, same language in the order itself. And. That's really a more a matter of a form uh, than subject, but I just do not see the need to repeat it. So, so, uh, so, so more a matter of form than subject. So, if we, so it's more a matter of yeah. Just if you can say a little bit more about that, just so we make sure that. Well, in, in the sense that if you have the definition of relinquishment, which is extremely broad um, in itself, particularly when you add in the section that talks about uh, section. Looking at line 18, any other information that will assist the officer in the expedited access, retrieval, or delivery of firearms um, it literally allows you know, the police uh, significant discretion in what they're asking um, the individual to do to relinquish the firearm. I mean, it literally is anything. Um, and so these cases, I would expect, would be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. It's going to be hard to compare uh, one to the other. Um, and I, if you're going to have the definition or adopt that definition, um, I think the officer can 
respond to the, the uh, able to respond to the facts before them in an individual case without the necessity of that language again being repeated in the order. But it seems that it's serving a more of uh, the purpose it's serving in the order is to instruct the defendant as to the defendant's obligations. Uh, that they're to relinquish this pursuant to the instructions of law enforcement that they're supposed to provide certain information. So uh, maybe we don't need them both, but I would be inclined to get rid of the definition before I get rid of the instructions to the defendant, which would be in the order. If I was going to have one, um, I would suggest by having the, the definition but you're assuming that the defendant will have access to that definition. I mean, yeah, I know we assume that people understand what the law is, but... When you have a, a clause such as the last clause that allows the police any other information that they need in order to relinquish the firearms, um, that should be a sufficient for their purposes. Again, it, it's, I'm not telling the committee to include it or not include it. I don't think it's necessary. I think if you have a definition that's as broad as that, uh, that gives the, the uh, law enforcement the ability to exercise their discretion in the field depending on the particular circumstances before them. And it's not necessary that it be in the order. Can I ask you a slightly different question? Sure. Line? So if it's included in the order that you require the defendant to relinquish the firearms pursuant to the instructions of a law enforcement officer and provide that other information. If they don't do that, do we then have a violation of the use prevention order? If they don't do what, I'm sorry. If they don't follow those instructions that would be in the order, uh, relinquishing the firearms pursuant to the instructions and providing this various information. Well, if they don't follow the officer's instructions, they're going to be violating the order. Right, if it's in the order. I'm saying if that language, is, as we have right now on page 7, is in that order, if they thereafter do not follow the instructions of law enforcement officer. I think they would be violating the order with or without that language in the order. In other words, the definition, I think, addresses what relinquishment means. And it's a very broad definition of relinquishment. Right. But I guess I'm still concerned about the notice of the defendant of what is expected. And, and that's a valid okay. issue for the committee to resolve. Right, thanks. <coughs> um, on the bottom of page six, keep in mind that at that point in the process, remember that's the final order which, at least in the bill, comes before the emergency order. That language, upon reflection, the, the language that speaks to evidence that the defendant is in possession of firearms, owns or controls, is not as significant in the final hearing as it is in the emergency hearing. The simple reason that if the order is granted on any basis in a final hearing, the law requires relinquishment at that point. And it would be essentially be mandatory. Federal law says you cannot possess. Um, so this language you'll find also in the emergency order, and that's where we, we specifically <coughs> wanted it in the emergency order so that there has to be some evidence before the court of possession and control of firearms on an emergency basis to justify their relinquishment on an ex parte basis. And it comes in for a final hearing if the order is granted an order of uh, a final order because of the implications of federal law. You could still uh, order, you would still order relinquishment even if there was not evidence of firearms. So it's more to clarify. The standard doesn't have to be the same at the final as it is on uh, the emergency basis. But are you okay with it being in there as far as uh, if there's evidence? 
I'm okay with it as long as um, someone doesn't interpret it that without that evidence you can't order relinquishment. Yeah, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that. But remember, it's always subject to interpretation. I mean, it's saying that if it, the evidence that is there or shall issue the order with relinquishment, it doesn't say anything that if the evidence is not there, it doesn't prohibit the court it doesn't say from it. doing that. Right. But I'm not going to tell you that somebody may not interpret well, it. Well, sure. What's up? Okay, so I'm a little bit lost here. So on the bottom of page six, that, that's where this turns into a final order? Is that just where you were? Yeah. Yes. So that language here turns into final order. Yes. Are you saying, is your question that and it's changed to make this section of the bill the final. I'm just, somehow or another, I'm just trying to follow so this whole I, I thing. Think hopefully, it, maybe this will clarify. If you go to page nine, beginning at line five, this is where we're really talking about an emergency order. And remember, the, it's the way the bill is structured, that, and the, actually, it's the way the statute is structured. So that's part of the confusion. But if you focus in on how this comes into the court, it'll come in on an emergency basis, which begins on page 9. That's where the language says, and you remember the discussion very early on in this bill, that on an emergency basis, if you remember, witnesses were going back and forth whether the court should require the plaintiff to disclose information or whether the plaintiff should have the option of disclosing information about firearms. And so this was a way for the court to exercise its discretion in a given case that if there was evidence of firearms, then they could mandate relinquishment on an emergency basis. And, and that language, and that was the reason for it, because on an emergency basis or an ex parte basis, uh, there may not be information about firearms. And so it allowed the court to exercise its discretion on an emergency basis. But then when you go back to page six, that's really a final order. And the circumstances are different. Because if you grant a final order of relief from abuse, there is a federal prohibition against possession of firearms and relinquishment would be mandated at that point. Or else the person would be violating. Okay, so then didn't I just hear that uh, re relinquishment wasn't in there, but it's on the page on the top of page seven, right? It is. It's just the circumstances under which I think what we had talked about earlier um, is that if the court found abuse, that they would they shall order relinquishment as part of the final hearing. So that word abuse gets, that's where. If they, if they issue the final order, okay. they shall order relinquishment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I just want to make sure I, I was clear. Um, so I understand federal law makes one a prohibited person uh, if there's a uh, final RFA issue. <coughs> does, does it say, that, I don't recall that the federal law requires relinquishment of firearms. It says you're a prohibited person. Right. And so if there's you can order relinquishment because you've now issued the final order. The issue we were wrestling with earlier in, in the testimony was the discretion the court had at the beginning. Right. So but if this bill comes, <coughs> it will also be You'll have the same situation for a temporary RFA, except it's state law that will prohibit a person from having a firearm, not federal law. So that analysis, that rationale could apply for both the final and the temporary. But I think we put this in here on both the final and the temporary, because if there isn't any evidence of firearms, we don't want to have necessarily, unless the court has some other reason to put it in there, that 
order, which then is going to activate law enforcement to enforce that component of the order. So that's kind of the rationale behind why it's set up this way. And I guess that was an explanation. And to make it into a question, I'll ask you to comment on my understanding of that. <laughs> if I followed your question, or your statement that became a question, I think in an earlier draft, and I could be wrong, but my recollection was that at the time of the final hearing, the draft indicated that if the court issued a final order, they would mandate review. So that's why I wanted to make, I mean, if that's what the committee's choice is, that's their decision. I just didn't, the, the rationale for this statement, evidence of firearms, was important from my perspective on the emergency order. Right, and, and more and so. The more we looked at it, it was like, well, that rational makes sense with an emergency order because of the state prohibition. But we went one step further and said, well, does it make sense to make sure there's evidence of firearms in either of those? And that's why we've ended up then playing in here. I just wanted to make sure I understood why it was there. Okay. Um, page seven, uh, again, line 16 through. Beginning on line 16, that's the language that we talked about earlier, that the uh, relinquishment, that would be part of the order. And I, my view is that it's just not necessary, but again, that's a decision for the committee. Committee to make. And if you read <coughs> The reason I thought it was redundant in part was if you look at the language beginning on line 16 on page 7, it says, require the defendant to relinquish the firearms pursuant to the instructions of a law enforcement officer. And if you read the top of page 8, paragraph PB, any other information that will assist the officer, I mean, that phrase is redundant with the other one. You're basically saying whatever the law enforcement officer says individual has to do. But again, this could be viewed as form over substance. I think the next page I have with changes in the green um, this is the emergency order. And again, it repeats that same language, the, the definition of relinquishment. Uh, reading down, in addition to green, I have some aqua blue, uh, if I can use that term. Um, I'm not sure what the significance of the blue is on immediately. That's an added word. Uh, my concern, and I think I made note of it in an earlier comment, was uh, on line 13, where it says adhere to the provisions of a subsequent order immediately. Um, I'm sorry, could you, could you just tell us what page you're on? Sure, I'm sorry, I'm page 10. Losing track of I'm sorry, page 10. Okay. Uh, on line 13, it looks like the word immediately is added in this draft. I think um, we're looking at a different version. What draft do I have for I have 7.1 at 129. Yeah, oh, so yeah. That's, that's what we have, but here is yeah, page 10. Well, immediately is added with blue, right? On, page, on line 13, page 10? No. 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 Yours is struck. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the whole so, section is. Mine is struck. Yeah. 11. <laughs> And the only the group? 12, 12 through <laughs> the whole thing is struck in your life. Oh, I have a, I have a, I have a lot of <laughs> This is the right time of day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one served, always served, but it's kind of struck, I think. Yeah. So if the whole thing struck, then mm -hmm. right. Right. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that one oh, word. That's the wrong version. Um, uh, but that's 
do we know if all these versions are the same? You were looking at the wrong one, you're saying? I think I was looking at the wrong one. Right, but he's looking at the correct time, date, and, right, yeah. and draft. Right, and now he's got mine, so I don't have to ever change it again. Hang on to it while you're doing that. That's fine. Okay. As long as we all have the same draft in both of us, then. So let's make sure that the judge has that draft. Yeah, so let me share my page, Yeah, so you're looking at it. Right, I, yours is different. It is. <laughs> I got the yellow one. Find more attractive. <laughs> one of the best for you. <laughs> what number are you up? I have 7.1. It's different than ours. 129. No changes made, so. Mm -hmm. Color printer went a little crazy with the tone. Could be. <laughs> so it looks like, according to your draft, your section of small v. This is also structured, sorry. Right, no, that's what I was getting to. Yeah. The I. The I is yeah, gone. That's gone. Right. Yeah. So, again, re remember. Now I'm looking at VII, inform, this is on line 17, inform the defendant that third-party storage of firearms is not permitted um, unless the court makes findings. Again, this is just another example of, I don't think it's necessary to be in the order because we're not going to order third-party storage on an emergency order. Remember, this is an emergency order. Um, and the law already says that we can't order it. And so I'm just concerned about these orders. Uh, Containing so much information, the, the important things, uh, date and time of final hearings, and things are lost. So I, I just don't think it's necessary to be in there. Um, on page 13, beginning at line 5, is the language that the court proposed, 5 through 8 say that the ex parte temporary order issued shall remain in effect until it is either dismissed by the court or the petition is denied at a final hearing. If the final order is issued, the temporary order shall remain in effect until personal service of the final order. Um, and that's the language that we had proposed and would ask the committee to consider adopting. Um, it'll make a difference in a lot of respects. It'll allow that temporary order to continue. What we see now oftentimes is when an emergency order is issued, every order calls for a date of final hearing. But it also says the order will expire at 5 o'clock on that day. <clears throat> oftentimes, if we don't get service of that initial order, what we then have to do is reissue another order. There's <coughs> multiple orders out there. This will allow us to keep one order out there that remains in effect and just send uh, for service a new notice of hearing on that. So I think it, it, it'll improve the process in a number of respects. Yeah. Um, page 14, um, I have it as lines 8, eight through uh, 18. There's some green. And I would just say, again, as it lines 8 through 18, this is going into the return of service. And I think I testified earlier that all of what you have here goes without saying. I don't think it adds anything to the return of service um, to include it. And I know there was testimony or comment that this is not for the benefit of the court or law enforcement. Um, but again, I'm just concerned that um, these documents contain more information than they have to. They're serving a different purpose. Um, and I think we just have to be careful. I think 
and I, uh, the section, uh, the next green section I have is on page 17 on uh, liability, and I think we would not offer an opinion or statement with respect to that. And the new section, I didn't pick up on it the other, when this first came in. I'm looking at page 20, a new section B that talks about a motion. This is where a family member can seek an so-called Urkel order. It says a motion filed under this section may only be based on an allegation the petitioner poses an imminent and extreme risk of causing harm to another person. It shall not be based on an allegation, essentially of self-harm, potentially causing self-harm. Uh, I hadn't seen this before, and I, I guess my only reaction would be, as I recall the history of the Urkel orders, um, could be wrong, but it was my impression that that's what these orders were designed for, either um, that the person presents a danger, risk of harm to themselves or others. And so I was surprised uh, to see that language, and I guess that's all I can offer in that regard. The, the committee knows that my concern about <clears throat> there's nothing simple about requesting these orders, and I think it, it, it would put an individual at a difficult uh, process to process these, but if it's in the bill, we will assist without advising. That, those are the only comments I had, unless folks have questions. Oh, no, sorry. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Beth Navani from the Vermont Police Association. Um, so I had sent some comments out this uh, this week to uh, Legislative Council in response to 7.1. I'll take you through those very quickly, and then I know that there's some um, questions that you have around impeding, and be more than happy to address the Attorney General's opinion, um, especially under State versus Berard. So let me start with House 610, version 7.1 at 1.29 p.m. <laughs> um, I won't go over the, uh, the, the uh, comments I made with respect to typos and numbering, but we'll just launch into the substantive areas. Page 4, line 10. I know we're going to come back and talk about impeding, but I want to at least <clears throat> have you note this so that you have it. We would propose that after the phrase law enforcement officer, that we add uh, the words so it read, um, let's see, who refuses to obey instructions from a law enforcement officer issued by a law enforcement, oh, excuse me, how did I put that? Let me go back here. After law enforcement officer and for insurance certifies issued by a law enforcement officer. So we want to have uh, it's failure to obey instructions from a law enforcement officer issued by the law enforcement officer to ensure. So this is clarifying language that makes it clear that the law enforcement officer's instructions are, um, are limited to those which ensure the safe removal of the firearms and to protect the safety of the officer or other persons present. It's limiting language upon the instruction itself to law enforcement and, and that modification is necessary. We don't want to penalize someone for refusing to obey an instruction because they're trying to ensure safety. So it's just it's just to make it grammatically correct. We can come back to that. Page eight, line three is my next correction or request for change. Can you say this page? Now? Page eight, okay. line three. And I'm going to ask for similar language. So this is the section that has to do with what is what does in your line three yeah, say? Because yeah, yeah. I have three stars. <laughs> yes, yeah, so right. right. Well, I would add. Oh, okay. A subsection. Gotcha. That's why right. I took advantage of your three stars. All right. <laughs> it would essentially say inform defendant of the provisions um, under Title 20 BSA 2307B1 that relinquishment shall be to. And then you would list the uh, relinquishment options under, an, uh, under I believe this is the emergence, excuse me, this is the final order that would be available under a final order. 
the reason we want to add that into the court order itself is because you want very clearly written for any defendant what the relinquishment options are under the law. And if the court, the court will create the form, it'll say, defendant, you may, under the law, under Title 20, Section blah, 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 relinquish, and then they will list the options. It is a way to minimize misunderstanding and to maximize um, for the defendant um, uh, knowledge about what the right next step is for them. We don't want to set them up for failure. We want to set them up for success. Same type of, of request at page 10, line 18. Here I would just modify what appears at line 18 in little b. And that is not just to inform them about third party storage, but inform them what the options are under Title 20, at least what the court is saying in the order that the options are. And if the court is determining third party storage is not an option, that's what it will like. That's what it'll list. But there are other options, and we want them all there for the defendants so they know exactly what, what they need to do to comply with the law, to set them up for success, not failure. And the last substantive change appears at page 16. Line 19. This is the liability provision. And it should include liability extending not just to the um, to, to property damage while accessing firearms, but also while removing them. It's the whole process of accessing and removing. And those are the requested changes other than the comments I made with respect to typos. Or so, um, so Beth, would you say, I heard you just use the word substantive. So um, well, do you think these are substantive or are they? They're clean up. Clean, so clean up, which, I, which I think is, is different. Yeah, I think it's. I think it cleans it up and I just think it, I think it makes it clear, clear and within the intent of what we've been discussing in this language. So I, I just want to come back to the impeding piece, which for all of you begins on, really substantively begins on page four. The actual crime is hindering, and it's at, um, the impeding of police officer, public officers, is at Title 13, Section 3001. And if you recall my testimony, I, I argued for the creation of subsection B because uh, I did not think subsection A would give authority to law enforcement officers to control the scene except and unless and until somebody was actually in the law enforcement officer's face, physically obstructing them in some way, some uh, affirmative action. The very argument I was making is exactly what the court was talking about in Berard. They were talking about the application of subsection A for failing to abide by a law enforcement officer's instructions. And the argument from the officer is, you're impeding my authority. And the court went through an analysis about that and indicated that that wasn't the intent of the legislature. So they talked about legislative intent as to whether hindering an officer could encompass violation of a civil law. So they spent some time on that, and they came to the conclusion, as I would have as a prosecutor, it doesn't apply. This isn't what that subsection A was intended to apply to, which is why I'm asking you to create subsection B. B allows the officer to control the scene through an instruction. What does that look like? It means that the instruction has to be tied to ensure safety, meaning the officer can't just issue any instruction. And with anything that officers do, it also has to be constitutional. That's a training issue, and we always train around what the parameters are. The actual violation occurs when someone disobeys an instruction that is given by the officer. And I hear what the Attorney General's office is saying, no matter 
what the action of the officer is, they always have to establish probable cause. This is true under anything you create, whether uh, in Title 13. There's always a need to explain in an affidavit what is the probable cause to believe the crime has occurred. You have to explain what occurred, how it fits within the statute. And these are going to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. The specific instruction is with clarity, if you wanted to add language, that uh, the officer has to notify the person that violating the instruction puts them in jeopardy of violating 3001B, fine. <clears throat> that puts them in clear notice that to disobey the instruction puts them in violation. But as a practical matter, they're likely to do that anyway. They are likely to indicate that if you don't obey my instruction, then you'll be subject to arrest. That is clear notice to someone that the next act they take could be in violation of the law. Whether or not uh, a prosecutor charges it because they've decided that there is or is not probable cause, or whether or not a court decides after a motion to dismiss it survives, or whether or not there's a conviction that is always in play no matter what any officer does. It is a process. And there are always constitutional constraints. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that in any particular case, these will that there won't be a claim that something was not constitutional because that exists with anything law enforcement does. That's just a fact. So it is um, one of the most important things. There are two mo two really critical pieces here when it comes to safety. And on the safety side of the equation, the ability to control both the defendant and the people in the house, always subject to constitutional constraints, uh, which is a, a training issue. Uh, but I read Berard, and I, uh, the court never really um, talked about the void for vagueness piece too much, because it had decided, based upon uh, an interpretation of, of whether the, what the legislative intent was under 3001, and whether that could be applied to enforcing a civil violation. And for the very reason I've asked to create B, they decided A did not apply. That is, that is exactly why I want you to create A, because I don't think A would apply. We want to allow there to be control when someone is six feet away and not have the officer have to wait until that person is in their face with a firearm uh, potentially in the, in the mix. That's just not where we want to go with this. So, that's the reason for the request. Um, I will note that there is um, analogous language in Title 23 that essentially creates a violation for failing to obey an officer's instruction. I can read you the exact language. Can you give part with this was, citation for that? I do. Let me just pull it up. I want to make sure I get it right. It's Title 23, 1013, Authority of Law Enforcement Officers. Enforcement officers may make arrests for violation of this title, may act, direct, control, regulate traffic, and make reasonable orders, orders in enforcement of this title to prevent or alleviate traffic congestion, property damage, or personal injury. No person may knowingly fail or refuse to comply with a lawful order or direction of any enforcement officer. That's been around since 1971 the modification in 1973 and not found to be unconstitutional. It's used all the time on a regular basis. Um, and you know, here an officer has to decide whether they need to make an order to alleviate traffic congestion in the same way an officer at the scene and serving one of these relinquishment orders has to decide whether they are making an order to ensure the safety. No different. It's the same construct. Um, and an officer is going to have to uh, make a determination of probable cause. No different than any, any offense under Title 13. I can't tell you how this will all sugar out through the courts. I suspect that the judge is correct. He's still here, that this would, would be some area of challenge. But that is the way uh, you can expect it to go when you create a new offense. And you know there will be a lot of training around all of this. There has to be, and hopefully it'll include guidance from prosecutors and the Attorney General's office. Thank you. Uh, so there was, I think, an apparent ambiguity. I want you to comment on this. Uh, on page four, line lines eight to 13, but really focusing on line eight to nine, 
a person present at a location during the lawful search for or seizure or removal of firearm. Should be A, I guess, huh? Uh, yeah, well, that wasn't my question, but yeah. Okay. Uh, pursuant to this order. So the, the question is whether the, the scenario that we were kicking around uh, this afternoon was a situation where there's just the re there's just the order, including relinquishment. And the officer is at the door and asks the individual to uh, relinquish their weapons and follow his or her instructions, the officer's instructions. You know, let me in, whatever. And the person says no. Right. Um, <laughs> So if they went forward and tried to, you know, well, well I guess there's a couple of questions. Maybe Matt should be asking a question. Oh, I like hearing you do it. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll keep good going. practice for yeah, you. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if we can stop right there, because that question isn't designed to ensure the officer's safety. Well, no, my, my question is whether that would be a uh, subject to a lawful removal. Uh, so the person refuses to obey his instructions, like, I need you to get out of the house. But it could be any, you know, it, it, but, but my question, and Matt can now clarify, because I'm bowling this whole thing up from his perspective, but my question was this, the removal pursuant to the order, not the warrant, the removal pursuant to the order, not seizure, right. that that would have to be done pursuant to an exception to the warrant requirement right. for so it to be lawful. It would is true for law enforcement in general, as you can write all the statutes you want, but always they have to operate within the constitutional constraints, always. Which means that for Which a means, seizure or removal, if you want right. to call removal, you need to have a warrant. Or an exception. Or an exception. And so I think we need Maybe add some language, even though that's implicit, just to make that very clear that we're not all of a sudden trying to create an opportunity to go in somebody's house with just this order and without a warrant and just this is the authorization to go in the house. No, it's not. It's only if you have an exception to the warrant. Right. I mean, they would be trained that this isn't permission for them to violate the Constitution, so they would understand that. Right. But you could add language if you wanted to that said nothing written herein is intended to grant authority of an officer to conduct a search, a seizure, uh, you know, without, you know, unless pursuant to a warrant or uh, an, a recognized exception to the warrant right. requirement. Yeah, we would use that language. Elsewhere. Right. You could. Just to make it very clear. Right. All right, so I couldn't hear your question on that, so I'm gonna... You did pretty well. <laughs> I do have a different one. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I wanted to get an op your opinion on something on page 16. Um, with line 12, we crossed out the section. What page on that? 16. Actually, I won't say we. We haven't done this. <laughs> the presenter of the amendment has crossed out, or the presenters have crossed out section and put in the word chapter. Right. And I'm curious if you can comment on the need for that and what's the why should we keep it as chapter instead of going back to section? Well, if you just leave it to the section, and I'm, you want it under the chapter because the chapter is about your relief from abuse orders, and it's not specific to just that one section. Hmm. Somewhat. Said, well, it's the service of the warrants, which is when you're getting the all the stuff about the, relinqu the relinquishment is in there. In that one section. Right. The chapter is pretty big. Exactly. It's about the chapter, which is a civil process mm -hmm. that law enforcement isn't a party to, but participating in with an assist. So in um, so it is intended to apply to the chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> if what are some of the issues that you see if the word section is used instead? What are the problems with that? So 
I'm assuming that it would only then apply to Title 15-1105, which is service of the order. Yes. And warrant. All right. Mm -hmm. So then it wouldn't apply to 1004. Nope. Which is the service of the temporary order. Mm -hmm. Which is actually uh, would one service of temporary. Emergency relief is 1104. So you're concerned that it would be only uh, that it wouldn't cover law enforcement to a large enough extent because they're involved in delivering the orders. And it wouldn't apply to 1103. Right. Which is the, one of them's emergency and the other one's final. Mm -hmm. So you're concerned that the law enforcement would have liability when serving either the emergency or final um, relief from protection, uh, relief from abuse order? Yeah, I mean, the whole point is that law enforcement is part of this, is pulled into this civil process between two private parties, plaintiff and defendant. Mm -hmm. So we would want this provision to apply to the chapter, which speaks to relief from abuse orders generally, if I'm correct. So do they have that now under the current relief from abuse order language? No. No. Um, but they do have it in another section of law in connection with firearms and domestics. It's just a very specific criminal statute. So is the concern that because we're adding family members that they're not involved? Because in the past, under current law, either the law enforcement officer or the state's attorney has to bring the action. So there's some sort of I think that's touch. a different chapter, though. Yeah. Because it's the extreme risk protection order. That's a different chapter? OK. I, I'm, I believe chapter so. 21 is the abuse prevention chapter. Right. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out why we're putting so much, why we're extending this to a chapter. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the ramifications are. Well, well, or what we're missing by not, by keeping it as section. So you're more inclined to miss something than you are to over apply it, if that makes any sense. The subchapter is broken down into definitions, jurisdiction, the types of requests, emergency relief service, procedure, filing orders with law enforcement personnel and Department of Public Safety in the database, enforcement and appeals, child support. That's the full chapter. That's the full chapter. That's the full, that is subchapter one. Subchapter two is the Re Fatality Review Commission. Subchapter three is address confidentiality provision. I'm happy to limit it to subchapter one if that's what you're looking for, because it wasn't my intention to, to put it with the other. With all, I, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how one Subchapter one works if you want to do that, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. 